Hi everyone, welcome to episode 34. Today I'm with Matthew Kitch. We met through our North Side Young Life and we are both leaders for our different school FCAs. And it has just, I don't know, we just, how long ago was it? It wasn't very long ago that we met. A few months ago? Yeah. Um, yeah. But here he is, here we are. The first thing I'm gonna ask you is what is your testimony? Yeah, so I was born into a Christian family, grew up in church, um, had a belief in God, but there wasn't really any heart change or intention in that. Uh, I didn't understand what I was doing. I just went through the motions, really. Mm -hmm. um, that was, I mean, that was when I was, all through when I was younger. I was born in Portland, Oregon, and I was baptized as an infant there. Um, and uh, when I was two, moved here. And we started going to CFC, um, Christian Fellowship Church, uh, but after a few years, uh, we moved over to Faith Bible Church, and we've stayed there since and found a really good church family there and a lot of friends. Um, in 2014, uh, my dad was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain tumor called glioblastoma multiforme, and he went through he went through the normal cancer treatments, so radiation therapy and chemotherapy and all of that, um, but it was, it wasn't as hard on us. I mean, we've, we've been a very medically centered family. My mom's a pediatrician and we had a good family, uh, a good family and good friends to really support us through that. Um, but, and he could do many things well for a while, but then um, because the tumor was in the front of his brain, after a while he started to, just his general quality just started to deteriorate and he passed away in December of 2015 after 18 months and I was nine and in fourth grade and my sister was five. And at that time I just became angry at God for that, I mean, asking why us, why him, and started to push God away, push myself away from others too. And uh, I also, part of that, I just went through a silly phase of not smiling in pictures for four to five <laughs> years. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but that was that was my brain at the time. I I just wasn't fit for interaction at that point. And I became a good at hiding. I became good at hiding my emotions. Mm -hmm. um, part of that was I just didn't want people to know how I was feeling. Um, didn't want other people to, especially other kids at school, to just think I was a cancer kid in need of sympathy, um, because for some reason I thought that would be degrading or embarrassing. And I thought I had to just maintain that strong presence, you know, like boys are supposed to be tough and it's the <laughs> stupidest thing in the world. But I didn't realize how comforting and calming compassion from others could be. And, and now I realize that time was just a lot of selfishness in my thinking, um, just trying to protect my own, um, my own thoughts and actions. Uh, when my dad got diagnosed with cancer, my mom's friend introduced her to an organization called Camp Kesem, and it's a national college group run by student volunteers. They fundraise all school year, and then over the summer they put on a free camp for kids ages 6 to 18, and their goal is to just support children through and beyond a parent's cancer. And I've been there for almost 10 years now, and I have you know, I've learned to open up, I've learned to be vulnerable, I've learned to uh, have true fun, honestly. Because I mean, you're in a community of kids who understand what you're going through, and student leaders who are not much older than you, who want to support you, want to make you feel loved. And um, really, when cancer is in the family, kids and the parents too, but mostly the kids, just have to grow up so much quicker than they normally do and it requires us to really care I mean care for a parent who's sick and the other parent is having to you know require more of the children mm -hmm. and because you know they're as worried as we are if not more because 
they realize what it is, whereas kids normally don't realize mm -hmm. what cancer is. And so part of Camp Kesem is giving kids that experience back to th that chance to be a kid again. And, um, and yeah, it, when my dad passed away when I was nine, my twin brother and I, I mean, we've, in that time, we've lost a lot of conversation with him and uh, a lot of that wisdom that we would normally get. And I mean, we're 17 seniors at Central and it's been eight, it's been, uh, yeah, nine years. Um, yeah, he passed away on December 3rd. So it's been close to nine years. And during that time, um, once I've hit high school, I started seeking out men who could help me understand biblical manhood and answer any questions that I had. Um, because as I started um, growing up and getting into middle school and then going into high school, um, I also just started uh, not growing away from my mom, but sometimes just getting embarrassed to talk to her. Mm -hmm. um, and I started looking for just someone to talk to. And the most influential mentor I've had has been one of my Young Life leaders. I um, started going to Young Life in my freshman year, uh, spring of my uh, freshman year, and I met on my first day of uh, club, I met Luke Miller, um, and he was just from Princeton. He drove 45 minutes down to see us and to hang out with us. And the moment I walked in, I mean, he was there welcoming me, um, and he was uh, he was so cool too. I <laughs> loved just having fun with him, and uh, and he also led well. I mean, he made sure that we were having fun, but also that we were learning who God was and who Jesus is. And when I went to Young Life Camp after my freshman year, I uh, really connected him, connected with him the most there. And we would have one-on-ones together and just talk through, um, you know, like whatever I was thinking, and it didn't even have to be about my relationship with God. He just wanted to become friends with me and really build that relationship. Mm -hmm. But halfway through the week while I was there, I gave my life to Christ. And that was, I mean, <laughs> you've heard it from everyone, that's the best decision you'll ever mm -hmm. make. And it was even that night, I could feel that difference, like something started in me. And, you know, the months after, we would hang out all the time, a few times a week, just and I would ask him so many questions, it's overwhelming him, <laughs> probably. Um, but he was just such a great friend, and he has really helped me learn what it is to be, uh, learn what it's like to be a Christian man and live out biblical manhood as God has instructed in the Bible. And yeah, now, um, senior in high school, uh, at the start of this year, I started leading FCA, um, Central's FCA, used to only meet, you know, once a month, mm -hmm. and some friends and I, we just wanted to do more with our group. We wanted to um, share the gospel at our school and in more ways than once a month, and so we started brainstorming over the summer, and we are now meeting every other week, and we've, uh, we are maxing out the room that we're in. We've had kids having to stand in the back, um, and it's, it's been so great leading with them mm -hmm. and being able to share the gospel at Central. And, I mean, just recently, at the start of this year, I've started to read my Bible daily. We started a New Testament and a year plan with our FCA group, so I'm leading them through that. And I've never had a daily Bible reading plan mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I in high school I play tennis, I'm in bands, and I have all sorts of these other academic commitments with, I mean, math team and Academy of Science and Medicine and all that, and my brother's in sports and my sister's in sports and my mom has always been busy with work, so we mm -hmm. are just a busy family. I know how that feels. And 
setting priorities in a busy life mm -hmm. is really hard. I mean, that's a that's a topic for an mm -hmm. entire other uh, day. But for sure, it was hard to set priorities. So even in my first few years of being a Christian, you know, I I did see change. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with a progressive sanctification, meaning we're becoming more and more like Christ every day, um, if you're a believer. And I often forget the progressive part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, I mean, we're still in high school, we're still teenagers, we still have our whole life ahead of us. Yes. Yes. And I've, especially recently, I've just ex been expecting too much of myself, honest, mm -hmm. that I just want to grow up and be better and I'm mm -hmm. tired of sin and I have to keep telling myself that it is a process, it's a journey. Right. This this life is a journey mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll be a long one <laughs> um, uh, so we can you know grow even closer to God and share even more. Um, but and it is, yeah, it's important to realize that for anyone even though like we're teenagers, I mean, we can still be, we can still be an example, but we are still young and have mm -hmm. still so much to learn and so For much sure. to become wiser in. For sure. I mean, wow, I didn't know half of that. <laughs> I didn't even know you had a twin brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's great to see that you like came to new God through that and your trials and that you took initiative to find like an authoritative figure. I feel like most people don't do that, so that says a lot about your character and your faith. Uh, but getting into the questions, how have you praised God in midst of your trials? So part of this, um, I want to talk about not only praising God in the midst of our trials, but with this situation, I mean, in Ephesians 6, 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for mm -hmm. this is right. As uh, a single parent, my mom has um, obviously some unique struggles, mm -hmm. and she's had to parent us um, in the absence of our dad, and that's hard on her because she's still working. Um, she, she still works as a doctor, and, you know, those are essentially 24-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I mean, prior to us getting our driver's licenses, I mean, she was also ferrying us around mm -hmm. like three different places at once. Right. And yet we were still being rude. We were still not mm -hmm. understanding. And that's, I mean, that's part of not being a Christian. I and mean, that sin is that is involved. I mean, we lie to our parents. We are, don't obey them immediately. And what the Bible says, I mean, Ephesians 6, 1, children bear your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And, I mean, I've <laughs> tried and failed many times, but, uh, I mean, as kids, we are called to obey our parents and not disrespect their wisdom and authority, because that's why God has, you know, put them in our lives, is because they are, um, I mean, with them being older than us, they have that wisdom, that experiential wisdom, and they can understand things that we can't even comprehend. Um, and, yeah, and again, again, that process of progressive sanctification, I mean, we are just called to become more and more like Christ every day and focus on that. Part of, also part of me praising God in this trial is remembering that God is good and loving Mm -hmm. um, and every day just reminding myself who God is. Um, and, and with that, I mean, my dad is free from pain because in, the, in heaven there's no crying, there's no disease, no suffering, there's only praise to God Almighty. And that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't comprehend God and all of who he is. I mean, uh, fancy Christian term, hypostatic union, that means, like, God is, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, mm -hmm. and in no other case does 100 plus 100 equal 100. <laughs> Can't take that to your math class. <laughs> but even so, it's true. I mean, God, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, yet he is one being, and 
I don't understand that. Not many people <laughs> do hard understand to totally that. It's wrap your head around for sure. Yeah, I mean, and that's just the least of it. I mean, there's so many other things that we just won't be able to understand, like mm -hmm. how the universe is infinite and God created it all and mm -hmm. He designed it all. I mean, it's just so amazing. But in the mystery of God, we have faith and we can trust in Him and continue trusting in mm -hmm. Him through our trials. That's the big thing. For sure. I think that trusting Him, that He created everything and Jesus is fully man and fully God, like, you just have to trust that and believe in Him. And when you believe those things, it becomes just a little bit easier to believe that God has a plan for your life. And even though things may be difficult and you may be going through hard seasons, um, He is still with you. He's still there for you. He has like a purpose for this that's going to make sense way down the road and he has better things coming for you and i liked what you said about obeying your parents because yes you're supposed to obey your parents here on earth but god is also called our heavenly father so we are called to yeah. obey him too what is the purpose of praising god in the first place like with or without trials yeah so i wanted to start with this off with um the first question of the westminster catechism um, a catechism is just uh, essentially a Christian Q and A. Um, they are there's different catechisms, but they are all books of questions and answers. And the first question of the Westminster Catechism is, "What is the chief end of man?" And its answer is, "To glorify God and enjoy Him forever." Mm -hmm. um, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And we are to praise God simply because of who he is. Um, that's the first thing. I mean, Isaiah 6, 2 through 4 says, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Even the angels can't look at God because he is so holy. And nowhere else in the Bible is an attribute of God said three times in a row. So this has to be special. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is holy, holy, holy. Um, and I mean, second, God desires praise because he created us for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And... We, he wants a relationship with us, mm -hmm. um, so he deserves praise. And, and also, you know, 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whatever you do, or whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Um, I mean, so firstly, we praise him just because he is God. Mm -hmm. He created us, he's the ruler of the universe. But also, you can't ignore this. He gave us his one and only son. Right. Um, he gave us his one and only son to die for us. And that it's so amazing in and of itself. And we have the chance for a relationship with our Savior and to be taken into the family of God. And that is the best gift anyone could ever receive. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, we also have his word. We have scripture to, uh, we have scripture and the Holy Spirit to guide us. And God has just gifted us so much. I mean, his scripture, his, the Holy Spirit, his son. So why shouldn't we praise him? Exactly. How loving he is and how he graciously and selflessly saved us from ourselves and from sin and how he constantly is pursuing our relationship with us. It's just, it's hard to fully wrap your head around how amazing and wonderful he really is because... We haven't experienced a relationship like that, like, in the flesh on earth, but it's just amazing. Like, he has a plan for everything. There, He's intentional with all of the little intricate details of everyone's life, mm -hmm. and the fact that he has given us life in the first place, and it's just so amazing. There are just a million little yeah. miracles. Uh, how would you encourage others to continue praising him in their suffering? There's, uh, I mean, quite a few different things. So sometimes when people suffer, I mean, there's so many circumstances that can cause suffering and that are suffering. 
and sometimes when people suffer they just don't want to be around anyone and don't want help mm -hmm. and that's natural because I mean that's the nature of suffering mm -hmm. is that it hurts us mm -hmm. um, but there's a few things that this that your answer depends on um, how should we uh, I mean yeah how we should um, encourage one another and in that suffering uh, one it depends on your relationship with the person um, if it's a close friend who's suffering or going through a trial then you'll have a lot more to say to them because mm -hmm. you know them um, versus if it's you know just a, an acquaintance or someone you just barely know or you know someone at your church right. that you might not talk to as much then sometimes there's not as much to talk about mm -hmm because I mean, you don't know them as much. Um, so it depends on your relationship with the person, it depends on how they're suffering. I mean, sometimes you just mourn with them, right. rather than saying anything, because um, and saying if they request it sometimes, or even if they don't request it, sometimes saying something can help, but it's also beneficial to just mourn with them and be there with them. And I mean, even just a presence can be soothing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it also depends on their personality, too. I mean, um, what type of person you know them to be if they're outgoing? I mean, they probably will be more open to conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're not as uh, social, then, I mean, just being with them is really comforting. And I think the most important thing, though, is that we shouldn't say nothing. Um, mm -hmm. But we should, I mean, just be compassionate and love them. You know, if you don't know what to say, just pray for them. Mm -hmm. um, maybe ask them if you can pray for a specific, uh, specific task or specific anything, but even so, just pray for them, pray for their comfort. And it's also important to just praise God with them in that, in prayer. Um, you know, just honoring God for what he has done in their life, um, not what he hasn't done. Mm. And, yeah, and um, really just telling them that, and telling them that you're praying for them, and asking what you f can pray for, and, I mean, prayer in and of itself is powerful. I mean, I, um, one of my FCA lessons this past semester was over prayer, and what I learned was that prayer is powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, for thinking back to, um, the Jewish community was praying for Paul when he was in prison and an angel came and released him from prison and that is, I mean, that's what prayer can do when you mm -hmm. have a community and friends and loved ones praying for you prayer is powerful um, uh, and you might not want to comfort someone by saying like let's praise God together mm -hmm. because, I mean, that's that's almost um, not insulting, but it almost is like mm -hmm. insulting to what they're feeling. Right. Um, like and you're not validating yeah. their feelings, even though like you are supposed to. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, and with that, we should just let them see us praising mm -hmm. God with them, um, like in prayer, um, recognizing who God is and what He has done, um, and that is praise and um, and hopefully they join you or at least see your love mm -hmm. for them and for God um, and really when you're talking with anyone it's the most important thing you can do is just always go back to the word mm -hmm. um, whenever you're in any conversation um, especially if you're trying to comfort someone or um, talk about them I mean 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture is helpful, and we should always go back to the word. I mean, God speaks to us through the Bible, and throughout all the scripture, we can see that he tests us and puts us through trials, but if we believe in him one way or another, he will deliver us. For sure. Uh, I think if you are someone who's going through suffering or just troubles right now, it's really important to cling to God because I didn't realize that until I was like isolated and didn't have anybody else to turn to. 
So it's important to cling to God because he is there to protect you and provide for you and comfort you and whether that's just calling out to him in prayer and starting to pursue a relationship back or it's reading his word and seeing like what he says and how to handle it. I think that is really important. Um, I say this in almost every podcast episode, but Romans 8.18 was my favorite verse during um, my time period where mm-hmm. all I had was God. And it's the pain you're feeling now compared to the joy that is coming. And I just lived by that verse. That's I just breathed it through everything. But yeah. if you know someone who's going through suffering, I would say just love them the way Jesus loves them and show them that and whether that's being like selfless or humbling yourself before them um, or just being patient and gentle but again praying on their behalf like doing the behind the scenes work is also very important and beneficial Mm -hmm. you've already given a couple pieces of scripture but are there any other certain verses that you cling on to yeah so i've actually found so many places in all all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament Mm -hmm. um, and just really a lot of examples supporting not only praising God but also how comforting he is. Mm -hmm. Um, In 2 Corinthians 1 3 through 7 says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it 